Acts chapter 1, uh, good to be here tonight with you all and all of you online. Uh, just right off the bat, I'm going to ask you to pray a uh, special prayer request for Michael. Uh, he is, uh, if you have followed what's been going on in Kenya, they are revolting and rightfully so. I, I, I don't know if I'll get kicked off the air in Kenya or not for this, but uh, I'm going to encourage those who peacefully protest to protest what your government is doing. They are, they are raising massively new taxes on the poorest people in the world. Okay, They're raising taxes and the government is taking land that doesn't belong to them. And it's not for the will of the people and the benefit of the people. You can guess where it's all going. You can take a guess and guess what's all happening with all that new tax money that they've raised and all that land that they're taking. Okay? And uh, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not trying to incite anything, but uh, it is a free country to some, in some respects. And uh, you, the, the government should be willing to listen to the will of the people. Does anybody know what the motto of the state of Missouri is? No, that's the, that's the slogan or whatever. Salus populi suprema lex esto. Yes. Let the will of the people be the... Didn't you take Missouri history? Let the will of the people be the supreme law. Yeah, it's a good one, amen? So let that be the, let that be the, the, uh, the logo or the whatever uh, of the people of Kenya. Let the will of the people be the supreme law. Government of the people, by the people, for the people, you know all that? Anyway, uh, they, they've protested, they have stormed parliament. Sound familiar? They had a crummy election. Sound familiar? And uh, so pray for uh, the people of Kenya. Pray for Michael. Uh, he is uh, in that area. I'm not going to say much more than that. So just uh, lift him up if you would, please. All right. Acts chapter 1, verse 4, being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but, quote, this is what your red letters are for, Wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. And that promise was what? What was that promise? What was it that Jesus promised and what they're waiting for? Holy, the Comforter, the Holy Spirit. That's right. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days Hence, now it's interesting to me, he didn't give them the exact day. He didn't tell them exactly what day because probably human nature kicks in and they wouldn't have done anything until that, like the day before that day. Uh, then they would have kicked it in gear. But Jesus deliberately didn't let them know when that was going to happen. It sounds like another event that he's not telling anybody when it's going to happen. Probably for the same reason. We wouldn't do anything until the day before. Or at least I wouldn't. I know me, I'm a procrastinator. And uh, so anyway, I'll read the rest of this tomorrow. I'm a procrastinator. Verse five, for John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? Um, you, if you want to put a note in your Bible, Ezekiel 37 uh, is the place where God promises that. He, that. He's got the two sticks. One is Judah, the other one is Israel. And the two sticks are going to be bound together. And they're going to have one king. Uh, Ezekiel calls him David, but we know it's Christ, the son of David. And he said unto them, verse 7, It is, uh, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power 
after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And verse 9, I don't have that up on the... I do now. Uh, he says in verse 9, and this is what we're going to look at tonight, and when he had spoken these things while they beheld, he was um, taken up. Think about it. And a cloud received him out of their sight. Let's keep reading. And while they steadfastly, while they looked steadfastly toward heaven, as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Uh, who were these men? Angels. Okay, they were angels. There are angels that look like men. Apparently, they don't have wings or their wings weren't manifested to them or whatever. But they, uh, they might have been the very two men that accompanied the Lord to see Abraham in Genesis 18. And then the two men who went to Sodom to rescue Lot and his family. Could have been. We don't know. We would assume that there's got to be more than two angels that look like men. Uh, but anyway, two men stood by them in white apparel, uh, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? For this same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. Father, we ask your blessings on your word tonight. Father, we pray for our brother Michael. We pray, God, that you would watch over him. We pray, dear God, that you would bless the work uh, that he's doing out there. Bless the work of our ministry in Kenya. Father, I pray for the people of Kenya. And pray, dear God, that uh, you would give them uh, good leaders. Leaders, fa Father, that uh, have the fear of the Lord in them. Leaders that know what the Bible says and, and uh, give... Uh, Give obeisance to it. They serve the Lord. I pray, dear God, that you would bless the people of Kenya. And Father, keep them safe during these troublesome times. And Father, that you would bless the people of America. And we are in troublesome times here. And we pray, dear God, Lord, that you would watch over all of us, that you would keep us safe. Lord, Father, that you would give us wisdom from your Holy Spirit on the way, Father, that we should go in these days. We ask your blessings upon your word tonight. We pray this in Jesus' name. And all of God's people said, Amen. This is one of my uh, favorite topics in the Bible. Uh, this actually uh, was like when I first started um, teaching prophecy-related things, um, I was at uh, Pastor Kelly's church, Liberty Faith Bible Church. This would have been probably around the year 2000 or so. And um, I had like four nights there. And I, um, I worked on a, just a series of teachings on how to understand the King James Bible as a book of prophecy. And this was, um, I think, the second or third uh, video that I made. It's like the first, first video first set of videos that I made way back then, back when we put them on VHS. Who remembers VHS? And I had in my office, I had a stack of six VHS player recorders, had them all hooked up to a master player. And back then I put six blank videos in and I put the master in and I hit record on all six of them and then hit play on the top one and I recorded six at a time. It only took two hours. And then I had to rewind them all. And then I put them uh, in a little box that we put labels on and we, we bought some, um, some shrink wrap to, that was made just for VHSs and I put them in the shrink wrap and had a, uh, had a blow dryer in my office heating it up to shrink the wrapping so the the, the labels wouldn't get uh, humidity on them. That was how we did stuff back then. High tech. Yeah, amen. And I thought, ah, we'll probably never go to DVD. Yeah, anyway. And, and I was expecting at some point that we would go to Blu-ray, but we're not. Because right now, everybody is streaming. They're downloading. All right. Anyway, 
So let's look at the clouds and the symbolism of the clouds. Let's go to Matthew 24. Follow along with me in your Bible and uh, mark some of these passages. Underline where you find the clouds in Matthew chapter 24. He mentions in verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days. But I want to um, just kind of look at a little bit of what is happening here. Matthew 24 is the chapter where they ask him, what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world and the destruction of the temple? And this is where he talks about, many shall come in my name saying, mine Christ and shall deceive many. And you're going to hear wars and rumors of wars, nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Famines, earthquakes, pestilences. Sounds like a really hopping time, doesn't it? Uh, I guarantee you the, the, the cable news companies will be all over these events. Uh, verse 9, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you and you shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. Uh, that sounds promising. Uh, many false, verse 11, many false, false prophets shall arise, shall deceive many. Iniquity is abounding. I'm just kind of hitting highlights here. Uh, look in verse 22 and except those days should be shortened. There should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. Underline the word elect. You study that word. Study elect, elected, election in your King James. Don't let anybody tell you that only Israel's the elect. It's not true. Paul said to us, Gentiles, be sure and make your calling and election sure. The New Testament speaks of us, the Gentiles, as also being part of God's elect. Verse 23, then if any man shall say unto you, lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. Uh, I think, I absolutely know for a fact that God knew the Catholic Church would offer the world false Christs. They do it in the form, number one, of the Pope, who is called the Vicar of Christ. He is Christ on earth, the human embodiment of Jesus Christ. Excuse me, Christ already had a human embodiment. Amen. But then they point to the Eucharist. And they say, here is Christ. And Jesus said, don't believe them. They're lying through their teeth. For there shall arise false Christ and false prophets and shall shoot great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, if, if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The word very means truly. It doesn't mean like you're more elect than other, you're better Christian than other people. So that has led some preachers and some church people to believe the false idea that there is two raptures, one for the good Christians and the second one later on for the bad Christians. You're only a Christian or you're lost, period. If you are saved, you are sanctified. You are cleansed, you are pure, you are born again. Not the outer man, but the inner man. There is no such thing as levels of Christianity. And I, listen, I've heard preachers preach that. Oh, well, you know, they won't get the rewards that the faithful Christians will get when they get to heaven. I, just, I can't believe I'm hearing that from people. You know what our, your reward is? It's what God told Abraham. I am thy exceeding great reward. Uh, then, then Jesus said in verse 26, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert. Go not forth, behold, he is in the secret chambers, believe it not. For as the lightning cometh out of the east and landeth in my backyard. That happened last night. Uh, Lisa said that she saw yellow flame when that lightning hit. I mean, it hit within feet of our house. And uh, I, didn't, I didn't feel like going out last night and looking for where it hit. You understand me. Uh, but it was close, and then we ended up without power for about two hours. But as for as the lightning cometh out of, out of the east and shineth even unto the west, 
so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. This is why all of my ancestors at Marcus Hill Baptist Church Cemetery are buried facing the east. And this is why they do it. In Christian, uh, in Christian cemeteries, um, they face everybody facing east. You don't want to have your back turned to Christ when he comes from the east. Now, verse 28, for wheresoever the carcass is, there will the eagles be gathered together. That's a whole different study we'd have to do. Now, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days, days, not years, days, not months, shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And this passage, what he's talking about here, this event, you'll find it Isaiah 13, uh, Joel chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, Jeremiah, I can't remember the chapter, um, Revelation chapter 6. You're going to find this multiple places in the Bible. The sun being darkened, the moon shall not give her light. The stars shall fall from heaven. That tells you that stars are not simply those big masses of hydrogen gas and this nuclear furnace that they are, that they are angels. Angels are going to fall from heaven to the earth. That's mentioned. Revelation chapter 6, Revelation chapter 12. And the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. That exact phrase, well, not that exact phrase, but that shaking is mentioned in Revelation 6 when the sixth seal is opened up. I'm going to read it to you. If you want to turn there, you may. Now I beheld, verse 12, and he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken, of a mighty wind and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. I want to tell you what, it is going to be a bad, bad day when that happens. If you're lost, if you are saved, he tells us, fear not, do not be afraid because on that day and the powers of the heaven shall be shaken. Paul said in 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2 that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Verse 30, and then shall appear the sign. And this is important. I believe this is really, really important. Um, if somebody came up to you and they said, we're looking for a guy named Mike Hoggard. And you say, well, yeah, yeah we know him. Uh, yeah, he's got, he's got uh, real long blonde hair. He's got a beard, mustache, weighs about 150 pounds. Does that sound familiar to anybody? Sure ain't me. He's five foot eight. Okay. You'd be going. That's not the Mike Hoggard that we know. Learn this sign. Then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven. That's the sign, with power and great glory. That's the sign. Now, contrast that with Revelation 13, where the Antichrist is. You have Christ... And then the opposite of Christ, Antichrist. Uh, chat, Revelation 13, 1, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. What is his sign? He comes up out of the sea. What is Christ's sign? He comes down from heaven with the clouds. Don't forget that. Because we know with this beast being the Antichrist, the opposite of Christ, 
We also know that he is the other Jesus that Paul mentioned in Galatians, no, excuse me, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He is the another Jesus with another gospel and another spirit. So, when this beast rises up, declares himself to the world, then shall that wicked be revealed, the man of sin, the son of perdition. He will portray himself as Jesus, as God. He, he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. The world, and I believe a lot of church people, are going to believe it. And they're going to believe it because they are being misled right now. They're being either mistaught or not taught at all. And they will not know the real Jesus from the fake Jesus. It's just like offering Jesus on one side and Barabbas on the other. They're going to be that different. But the world is going to pick the other Jesus. And a lot of church people are going to do the same thing. Many of them already do. Think about this. Is this the word of God? Are you sure? Okay. You've already selected the right Jesus. You've selected the right gospel, and it's the right spirit. The other Jesus is in those other Bibles. I've got somebody working on uh, right now a very timely project. Um, they've already started with the difference between the 1973 NIV and the 20, I don't know, 16 NIV. They're different. And she has started with John and started working her way down through the New Testament. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses that are different just between those two Bibles. And they're both NIV. So now she's starting on the 1995 New American Standard Bible and the 2020 New American Standard Bible. And I was looking at it today. I started in John 1, and by the time I got to verse 3, they were already different. Both between, between the 1995 and the 2020 Bible, they're different in what they say. Significantly different. That's how you get a new copyright, is it has to be different than what you derived it from. It's a derivative work. And when you have the Bible constantly being changed, constantly changed, constantly renewed, constantly redone, retranslated, regurgitated, all of those things, people will not know the truth. How can they? Amen? It's like, it's like Paige, it's like talking to your kids and getting five different stories out of four kids. Right? Yep! All right, uh, but anyway, learn the sign. Uh, verse 31, and he shall send his angels with the great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together. That's the gathering you hear me talk about. Gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. Matthew 26, turn there. Says it again. By the way, that's repeated in Mark, and it's repeated in Luke. They're the synoptic gospels, and so they all three have uh, slightly varying versions of uh, Christ's uh, Olivet Discourse, they call it. He's on the Mount of Olives, and he's telling them what's going to happen in the last days. Matthew 26, 62. The high priest arose and said unto him, Answerest thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses, or these witness against thee? But Jesus held his peace. Remember, he is as a lamb taken to the slaughter, and he openeth not his mouth. But Jesus held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. And it's, I, I almost picture Jesus kind of with a smirk here, because he's going, you said by the living God. You don't even know him. I do. I know him. It's like I've been with him for eternity. 
that thou tellest whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said. Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. Then the high, oh, this really got him. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witness? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. So remember, in Revelation 13, that the beast has the name of blasphemy written on one of his heads. Um, could it be that that name of blasphemy be Christ? Because that's what they mention here. Tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. That's just my little theory there. Um, but Jesus said, this is what you're going to see. You're going to see him sitting in the right hand of power, and he's coming in the clouds of heaven. 1 Thessalonians 4. Since Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24 that when you see the Son of Man coming in the clouds, he's going to send his angels to gather together his elect. So in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 15, for this we say, let's turn there. Give you a moment. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, means Christ is giving him these words, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. What does that mean, asleep? Death. They sleep, the Bible says they sleep the sleep of death. So all of our loved ones who uh, have died before us, uh, they are, I guess, sort of in a state of flux, as it were. Um, they will wake up the same day you and I rise up. They will go first. Uh, prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trump of God. That's what Jesus mentioned in Matthew 24, with, this, with the sound of the great trumpet, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them. Where? In the clouds. Why the clouds? Because that's where Jesus is going to be. He's coming in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Keep that in mind also. He's not coming down to the earth. He's coming, I don't know how high in the air, but it'll be high. Let's say higher than, uh, what's the tallest building? Is it now the Freedom Tower or Sears Tower? Huh? Freedom? Uh, there's a, I don't, anyway, I'm going to get into that. Anyway, higher than that, he will, will, shall meet us in the air, to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. And I like to find comfort in those words. Amen. He's coming for us. Don't worry about the details. He's coming for us. He will appear. When he does, we will be caught up with him. Only worry if you're not born again. Then he's not coming for you. I would get born again. Amen. Revelation 1. This is what is mentioned right off the bat there in Revelation. Behold, he cometh with clouds. That's the sign. And every eye shall see him. And they also which pierced him. And all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Think about that day. And we've already got you know, earthquakes and wars and rumors of wars and false Christs and pestilence is going everywhere. Now the sun's darkened and the moon's turned to sackcloth and the stars are falling. And so, and because the great day of his wrath is approaching. And so all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the ending, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come the Almighty. Next time you uh, have your Mormon friends come by your house, 
and knock on your door and they want to get into a conversation with them say look I'll talk to you if you answer one question brother Reg Kelly did this one time he had uh, he was coming out of a little cafe down there or something like that and he was in his truck and he pulled up to those two boys they were on their bikes had their white shirts dark tie and they started talking to him they said sir can we uh, talk to you a little bit and Reg said Tell you what, boys, I know who you are. He said, I'll talk to you if you'll answer for me one question. And they said, okay, what's that? And he looked at him and he said, is Jesus God Almighty? Very simple. And the lead boy started, I don't know, fidgeting around, trying to give, you know, a, an, an off-the-cuff answer that was safe enough to where he didn't admit that Jesus is God Almighty, but it sounded spiritual enough to satisfy the normal average person. Nobody ever accuses Reg Kelly of being normal or average. And Reg said again, now hold on, hold on. You've gotten away from what I asked you. I asked you the question, is Jesus God Almighty? And the guy did it again. And finally, Reg said, listen now, it's a very simple question. It's yes or no. Is Jesus God Almighty? And he said, that guy turned red in the face. He was furious. And finally he said, no, he's not. And Red said, thank you for being honest with me. Now, if you want to talk, we'll talk. I think that took the talk out of him. But ask him this. Ask, him that, ask your Jehovah's Witness friends that simple question. Is Jesus God Almighty? But it says right here, he is the Almighty. In fact, his name back in the Old Testament, wonderful, counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. The mighty God. He's the Almighty God. Anyway, Revelation 10. This is what we've been studying in Sunday school for the last three and a half years. I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven, clothed with a cloud. I just can't. I just can't get away from that idea that that's Christ. Oh, look, and a rainbow was upon his head. Where do you think we are to turn to now? Any guess? How about Genesis? What chapter? Oh, come on, this is so simple. Okay, I'll ask you a simple question. Is Jesus Almighty God? Okay, thank you. Genesis 9. Genesis 9. Come on. A rainbow. A story with a rainbow in it. That doesn't stand for Pride Month. Lisa... Tonight, we were over at Walmart, and they had, uh, you go to the clearance aisle, and they always put stuff out there, and there was a cup, a drink cup, that had these little rainbows on it, and the little saying on it was, I love someone who is queer. Yeah, I think she took a picture of it. She probably posted it. Let's find out what that rainbow really means. Look at verse 8. And God spake unto Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you, and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you, of the fowl and of the cattle, and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that go out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you. Neither shall, and think about the covenant that God swore in Jeremiah 31, 31, that he would establish with Israel. Behold, a new covenant I establish with my people. Um, think about that and, and Christ appearing in the clouds as being the token of, that he is going to now establish that covenant 
with the people of Israel. It, it falls, in my mind, it falls into place um, what we've been talking about in Sunday school about the mystery of God. Um, be not ignorant of this mystery, how that blindness in part has happened into Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles become in. When Christ appears in the clouds, um, we're going to be caught up. The time of the Gentiles is over. The fullness of the Gentiles is done. And now Christ is going to establish his covenant with Israel. And he says, I will establish my covenant with you, verse 11. Neither shall all flesh be cut off anymore by the waters of a flood. Neither shall there any more be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token. That word token and the word sign are the same thing. It's a token, it's a sign, it's a mark, uh, it's a way that God shows you this is, this is the one. So if somebody comes to you and says, do you know Mike Hoggard? Well, yeah. Uh, is he, what, about 6'3"? Weighs about 267. I've lost 25 pounds the last six months. Uh, and... Uh, Sort of dark brown hair, goofy acting. Yeah, that's him. His mom is crazy, Judy. Yep, that's the one. See, that's the sign right there. Uh, my covenant, which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. Verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud. There it is. Christ is the bow here. He's the bow. I do set my bow. And there's how many colors? Isn't that neat how if you take seven different colored crayons and mix them together, you get black. But if you take seven bands of colored light and mix them together, you get white. I don't get it, but I like it. I do set my bow in the cloud and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and and the earth and it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh now we're not going to get there tonight but uh, at when I come back we're going to take a look at those flood waters. God's not going to flood the earth with water. He's going to flood it with something else. Okay? And I will remember my cut verse 15, I remember my covenant which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. And the bow, Christ, shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. And God said unto Noah, this is the token. He says it again. This is the token. This is the sign. This is it of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. Turn to Ezekiel 1. I don't know if I had that in here. No, 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 no. Oh, no, no, no. Why don't I have Ezekiel 1 in here? Anyway, turn to Ezekiel 1. This, this idea of the bow in the cloud is, a, is itself a picture of something. Ezekiel 1 is where Ezekiel sees God's chariot. The wheels within the wheels, and they have the spirit of the living creatures in them. And this is God's UFO thing, all right? But it's his chariot where his throne is. And there is a, if you look in verse 26, there's a firmament that is over the heads of the four angels um, of the chariot. Uh, the firmament was, uh, that was over their heads was the likeness of a throne as the appearance of a sapphire stone and a Upon the likeness of the throne was the likeness as the appearance of a man above upon it. That man is Christ. It's God. And I saw as the color of amber, as the appearance of fire round about within it. 
from the appearance of his loins even upward and from the appearance of his loins even downward I saw as it were the appearance of fire and it had brightness round about as the here it is underlined this as the appearance of the bow that is in the cloud in the day of rain there he says it again so was the appearance of the brightness round about this was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord oh amen and I, when I saw it, I fell upon my face and I heard a voice of one that spake. Turn to Exodus 16. Boy, I could chase this all through the Bible. I love this. Turn to Exodus 16. You're going to see again God in the cloud. The glory of the Lord in the cloud. Oh, let's see here. Where is it, Lord? Yeah. Uh, Lord, help me find it. Somebody help me find it here. Where the glory of the... Ah, I found it. Verse 10. And it came to pass as Aaron spake unto the whole congregation of the children of Israel that they looked toward the wilderness and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud. What was in there? Rainbow. Shining out brightly. Mm. Who is that? It's Christ in there. What chapter is this? 66th chapter of the Bible. What does God give them? Something called, what is it? Okay. Or they're actually, they're Jews. They're going, what? What is this? Was is that? That's German. Oh, I love it. Here Christ showing himself to Israel, but they can't see him. Because he's in the cloud and they can't fathom it but it's their savior it's the one who hasn't been born yet but he's coming he's in the loins of the people of of judah passed down to david all the way down through mary and uh, joseph but through mary he is the son of david he's coming in the cloud so my my thinking is that uh, like i said before Antichrist coming up, coming up, like um, in uh, 1 Samuel, where Saul goes to the woman at Endor and says, bring me up a familiar spirit. And he asked her, what did you see? I saw God's coming up out of the earth. Uh, he's coming up out of the sea from the bottomless pit. And there is going to be somehow, some way, it's going to be an absence of clouds. When Christ appears, he's going to be covered with clouds. That's the sign. And it's like there are two Mike Hoggards in the state of Missouri. One guy, and I, uh, this is kind of a funny story, and I won't tell all of it. But when Lisa and I first got married, about three months after we were married, uh, we were staying in these apartments in Hillsboro, and the landlord, she said, uh, Mike, there's a guy here looking for you really who was it she told me the name I said I don't know him later that evening I got a call from that guy he said you Mike Hoggard yeah and he said I want my money I'm going who are you we went round and round until finally it dawned on him that I was the wrong Mike Hoggard and I'm going you mean there's two and over the years I've had uh, uh, companies that collect money collections agencies calling me and you're Mike Hoggard, we want our money. We want our money, we want our money. And then for a while, we didn't hear no calls. And then years later, I was up at the South County Mall and I was getting Lisa a present for Christmas or a birthday or something like that from jewelry. And when the lady said, okay, let's fill this out. What's your name, Mike Hoggard? And the, the gal behind the counter was just looking at me. And I said, why are you looking at me? She said, I was married to a guy named Mike Hoggard. I said, really? Was he a deadbeat and stole money from people and owes a bunch of money all over the place? She said, yeah, that was him. She said, he went into prison for a while. I said, that's what happened. It was just weird that this guy, Mike Hoggard, he was even on the news one night. They were saying, Mike Hoggard is in a real estate scam. And I'm going, no, I'm not. I'm just renting. So it was the wrong Mike Hoggard. So you got to make sure you get the right one. Amen. 